Welcome to another episode of Some Engineering Podcast. Today, we have Irinio Maikot, short HO. Um, HO is the founder and CEO of FeatureBase. HO, welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's great. I, I, we prepped a little bit for this session, and we're going to uh, go deep on a bunch of topics, right? Obviously, FeatureBase. Um, and uh, a little bit of, we're going to talk about bitmaps, we're going to talk about real-time data, the evolution of the data stack. But let's start with feature base. What is feature base? What does it do for me? Yeah, I think really simply put, uh, feature base is an old app database, you know, any old analytical database. But what makes us radically different is that we're built entirely on bitmaps. And unlike columnar databases, we convert data into what we consider an AI ready format features, and we store it as math, which is bitmaps, uh, not words, not language. Uh, I think if you decompose a traditional database, we're still organizing and storing data in this human, human centric sort of approach. And the benefits of turning data into math up front and storing data as math is that we get exponentially faster compute. Uh, we get a much more efficient 90, 95% reduction in footprint over the analytical databases. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's perfect for a lot of the emerging real-time workloads where we sort of sit between the streams and the data warehouses to power these new sort of continuous AI, continuous analytical workloads. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to unpack in that, what you just said. I'm I'm going to start with OLAP versus OLTP because it's 2020, almost 23, but I feel like some people still have to understand the difference between analytical databases and transactional databases. So an OLAP database, and you categorized feature base as an OLAP database, is really to analyze what's going on in the business, right? So you take existing data and you try to figure out what's going on pretty much, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think maybe more technically specific analytical databases store data by groupings of attributes um, as opposed to by records, which is what the transactional databases do. So analytical databases are not good at point lookups. They're not good at storing and retrieving single records. Um, and those are really the distinctions. And to add more confusion to this world, there's a lot of talk about hybrid workloads now, right? Analytical databases trying to be transactional or transactional databases trying to be analytical. But in general, Databases are either really good at single records um, or they're really good at analyzing, you know, attributes about the data. Yeah, yeah. So so then feature base is in the analytical world. And then we talked yes. about bitmaps. And I think let's let's do a little deep dive into into bitmaps and cardinality of data. Let's let's unwrap that a little bit for us. So how do people have to think about bitmaps? Yeah, so bitmaps uh, are really fascinating. Obviously, we've spent a lot of money. We've spent about $30 million in research on them so far, about nine years of our lives on it. And we think we're so, sort of at the absolute beginning. But let's let's just take it to a 50,000-foot view, right? Uh, transactional databases sto store data by row, columnar by column. Um, and with bitmaps, you're essentially storing data at the value, right? So due to the nature of bitmaps, uh, the data pertaining to each unique value within a column can be accessed independently without having to scan a row or scan a column. And so that means that analytical workloads like filtering, you know, take a typical where clause, uh, are very, very, very fast because the IO incurred on that workload is a fraction of uh, having to scan the entire column. Um, and yes, there's things out there like Arrow that help optimize the data in a given column, um, but scanning at the value, like going directly at that value, is the absolute quickest, fastest way to possibly do it. And so I think at the core, that's the biggest value that bitmaps bring to the table. Um, and if you want, I'll go a little bit into the history of bitmaps. I think, um, you know, yeah. we, 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 as, uh, we as humans have been working with bitmaps really even before this this famous paper that was written by Claude Shannon in 1936. But for me, the real beginning was in in 1936 when he wrote his master's thesis um, on really uh, the assertion that bitmaps um, could solve just about any mathematical problem there was, right? With just the basic building blocks of Boolean algebra, an and, an or, and a not, could do all of mathematics. And so that was essentially his thesis. Um, and as we know, that thesis gave birth to the modern processor and bitmaps power all of our computers, all of our phones, all of our servers. I think we forget because we take it for granted 
But those of us that went to sort of electrical engineering and, and more technical backgrounds know that inside of our phone right now, we're processing, literally adding bitmaps at a rate that we can't fathom, right? Like, you know, millions and billions per second. Um, and so in hardware, bitmaps are everything. In software, though, they've never really taken off. That said, we do have a history of bitmaps in databases. So, um, you know, databases like Oracle or Implies, Druid, um, they have used bitmaps for very specific index types for a while, but they're very specific. Um, and I think even, even more interesting, uh, people have sort of pigeonholed and stereotyped bitmaps as bad for high cardinality data, for example. Um, oh, yeah. But what's happened... Doesn't scale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Ex exactly. Bitmaps, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So those of, those of us that have known about bitmaps always had sort of some preconceived notions. But what has happened over the last seven, eight years in bitmap research is fascinating. And I give most of the credit to Professor Lemire, Daniel Lemire from the University of Quebec with his Roaring Bitmaps project, right? So Roaring Bitmaps showed that we could do homomorphic computation on bitmaps um, of varying density types. So if they were sparse, great. If they were ultra dense, great. If they had mixed density, great. Um, different compression schemes would kick in depending on sort of the, the, the density of the data. And that really is what gave birth so what we've done, um, you know, we we eventually took uh, and ported Roaring Bitmaps to Go. We wrote a 64-bit version. That was the beginning of our open source journey. Um, the project was originally called Pelosa. Um, then we realized, wow, we can do just about every analytical workload on bitmaps. It was a huge epiphany to us. We were teaching it integers and and floating point and fixed point. And, and, and when we realized that, and we got serious about turning this into an actual complete OLAP database. We retooled our format underneath the hood and we put in a B plus tree. Um, the bitmap sit in the leaf nodes of that B plus tree. Um, and that allowed us to bring in, you know, acid compliance, transactional guarantees, high availability. Um, and, you know, we're very close. We're, I would say, six to nine months away from having a capability complete OLAP database entirely on bitmaps. Um, you know, I don't think even we thought we would be able to do that three, four, five years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the execution of a workload, like in my experience, what matters is latency, right? Um, <laughs> right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what people care about. Right. Right. So there's lots of, um, lots of solutions out there to analyze data, right? The cloud warehouses being the most obvious one. And um, can you give me a sense of order of magnitude, like how much faster we're talking about here? Yeah, yeah, we're talking, talking definitely multiple of orders of magnitude faster. I think equally important, we're talking about at least an order of magnitude, sometimes two smaller footprint. So um, they're much more efficient to store, much more efficient to transport and manage. Um, so it's not just the speed, it's also the, you know, the, the size of bitmaps. And I think what's interesting about storing data as bitmaps is that essentially, while I overgeneralize it and call it turning data into math, essentially what you're doing is you're storing relationships between the data. So in our, in our underlying format, there's really two main com components, the translation keys and the bitmaps. And the translation keys are effectively an inverted database, right? We store uh, metadata about the data in the translation keys. That's what might have looked like a table before. Um, and that includes all the attributes, the objects, and the unique values. So we only store a value once in these translation keys. And then in the bitmap, we just store the intersections between the two. So when an object and an attribute intersect in a given record, we just flip a bit. So it's tiny. Um, it's really fast. It's really easy to access. It's highly vectorizable. Um, and, and so, um, so that simple notion, um, has given birth to an entire database. It really is like the particle of physics underneath the, the hood, but, uh, but far, far, far more efficient than converting what I say modern databases do from human to machine with every IO operation. Um, you know, we're taking words and English and trying to find those, you know, inside of these, in these columns. Um, and then we convert it into machine with every IO operation. It's crazy. So essentially this is machine code as a format and it does not get any faster than that. Yeah. 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 And so 
we've talked about fast. We've talked about small footprint. Um, and I want to get to some industry use cases, but before we do that, obviously the workload that offers itself for this is real time, right? Yeah. So can we talk a little bit of real time? Um, I know if you, if you present the option to people, they always say, yeah, yeah, I want real time. Right. It's like most of the times you actually don't need real time. You just need right time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but what are some, can you, let's, let's, what does real time mean for you? Yeah. So I think to, to, to really dial in on what real time means to me, because real time is a, a very misunderstood term. Let me talk about one more benefit of, uh, of, of bitmaps, right? We talked about simple. We talked about, uh, no, sorry. We talked about fast. We talked about efficient, but we haven't talked about simple. So one of the biggest advantages of fast is no longer having to pre-compute or pre-process. Uh, so today uh, there's an IDC stat out there that boggles my mind but it's estimated that nine in 10 copies of all data are pre-computed, pre-processed data that's either an index or a, a materialized view or an intermediary form of that data so that we can make it fast. Uh, all of that requires a lot of engineering, a lot of batch processing, uh, but when, can, when you can actually compute on that raw data, it can reduce the amount of data you have to manage, store, and secure by up to 90%. So simple to me is a huge attribute of this. And I think that is a good segue into real time. I think being able to do real time computation on raw data is the future. Um, and, and I define real, real time with four basic definitions. I like to call it LFTC because it kind of rolls off the tongue. They're not necessarily in this order, but L is for latency, F is for freshness, T is for throughput, and C is for concurrency. Those are the four attributes you need in my estimation to have true real time. Obviously you want low latency, but we make huge trade-offs for low latency. Typically we give up freshness or we give up throughput uh, or we cache or batch our data and stick it in Redis, right? We give up those other attributes for true real time. You've got to be able to have low latency, but also have the data propagate through your system instantly, right? From the time it hits to the time it's available in a query needs to also be milliseconds. And then throughput is another one. Most of our analytical databases are awful at updates, right? And we end up doing upserts and, 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 and copy on writes. Uh, you've got to be able to update and insert data at the tune of millions of records per second for some of these use cases, which is really unique to feature base. Um, but it's a very important part of the puzzle because otherwise you end up having to separate your reads and writes, right? We end up having two different systems, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that we have to manage. And then concurrency is a big one, whether you have a model that's, that's highly cyclical or you have a large consumer base, you want to be able to serve up a lot of, a lot of workloads. And I think as we head into the AI world, to me, we're sort of practicing the worst of LFTC, right? Every, almost everything is cached. You know, yeah. most feature vectors are coming out of Redis. Um, most of it, I saw somebody today say something interesting, which is like ML ops is really just another use case for reverse ETL, right? We're like, uh, we're, <laughs> we're pulling all the data back out and we're making yet another copy. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of fascinating. So real time to me is where you can make decisions on the fly, where you can continuously train and reweight your model on the fly, where the data that is happening in the environment around you is feeding that model so that you can make real-time decisions about that. Um, and I think arguably those use cases are still fairly ephemeral. Um, there's not a lot out there yet that that need that type of, of, of infrastructure. But I'm arguing that more and more every day as it becomes easier and easier to implement these infrastructures, everything is going to be real-time. We're going to look back in five years and go like, why did we batch anything? Why did we ETL anything, right? We're going to do our transformations, our joins, our aggregations. We're going to do them on the fly, in our query, in our code. Today, we have to version things and track lineage because it's propagating through multiple systems. But what of lineage was just what version of that model did you use to transform the code on the fly when you made that decision? as opposed to the, the, the almost unravelable ravelable complexity that it is today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, well, let's, let's go into those use cases, right? Uh, what we have today here and now, and maybe in the near future, when you tell me fast, efficient, simple, right? Then what comes to mind is obviously industries that need real-time decision-making. Maybe they have low margins, right? And so efficient yeah, is exactly. really good. And so, you know, what comes to mind is obviously 
uh, uh, financial trading, risk management, but also automotive, right? I think autonomous driving, it's like yeah. big, big decisions at stake here, right? Yeah. Um, and the automotive industry, they're penny pinchers in the literal sense. I, I know that's totally. more the car, not the real time decision, but right, um, right, but still, and, and yeah, but still, and then and then uh, obviously just training of uh, models and algorithms because if you reduce the time. To train them, I mean, you can just iterate faster, right? If you reduce the time to train a model. So, uh, can we like? I, I just made this up, but <laughs> do you have a few no, examples no, no, no. like this? Like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really great. And you know, some of us are part of that yay group, the yet another infrastructure group, and so we have hot takes. I think my hot take yes. as I go into this is that all of analytics today is mostly a query. Um, I would bet that in the next two to three years, most of analytics will become a model. Um, but as we go through that transition, we're still seeing a lot of real time use cases using queries around dynamic personalization, segmentation, uh, real time recommendations. Um, and I think we as consumers assume that these things are happening on the fly. But when we see, you know, that shoe follow us around after we purchased it, the reason that shoe is still following us around as an ad is because it sometimes takes 24 to 48 hours for all of that data to re-update, right? The batch processing that's yeah. happening behind the scenes. Um, the so nightly ETL moving, load. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, so those are more in the advertising consumer insights world, but anomaly detection is a huge one, right? Intrusion and fraud detection, network analysis, uh, everything that happens to touch IoT and edge, I think are perfect use cases. And I think, uh, as you talk about automotive, interestingly, we have not yet seen a lot of autonomous driving use cases because it needs such real time that it doesn't have time to go back to the network, right? It's doing everything in the car. Uh, those decisions are like sub millisecond. Um, yeah. So, so at some point we'll catch up and 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 be where they are. But right now, all of that real time is happening in the vehicle itself. Um, but in all of those, the, you know, those areas that I just described, we are sadly doing everything in batch. And some of the the scariest areas are around fraud, right? We deal with some of the biggest companies in the world. And when I see the way they make decisions about fraud, it boggles my mind. And they all have very strict SLAs, right? So like a credit card swipe, you have to make a yes, no decision in 50 milliseconds. You do not have time to compute the feature vector that's used uh, to, to decide whether this is fraudulent or not. So these, these fraud vectors are computed days ahead. Uh, so it's pulling a fraud vector out of a cache and it's using that to make the yes, no decision. So fraud happened in the window between when that was generated and when it was served, you're out of luck. Um, so yeah. those are areas where I would love to see all of it computed on the fly in that moment based on the totality of all data. And further, I look forward to being a lot more than just a query, right? This is where our, our sort of AI world is headed. And so we're in the early days of this this AI renaissance that we're seeing, but we we are starting to start to power you know conversational analytical use cases you know where where SQL isn't the only way to ask questions of the data. Um, computer vision is one of the areas that's most monetized at this moment. Um, you know, being able to help reinference those models on the fly based on the data that's happening uh, is a really good example of of real time. Um, and then you know these these large language models are fascinating and there's a couple of areas that we're experimenting with right now um, data where large lang language models that are fine tuning on the fly um, that's that's an exciting area the other one that we're really obsessed with right now is that when you're converting documents and information into these large language models you're tokenizing them and you're converting them into vectors they're getting stored as floating point when you run a query when you're at a prompt you're essentially finding all of the vectors that are related by computing the distance between those vectors. That's called a dot product. Those dot products are being computed on the fly. <laughs> now I'm going to contradict myself. Um, but it can be incredibly expensive, especially if you want to start looking at like, you know, neighbors, not just the related documents, but, you know, a, a ring around those. Uh, the scale of these models is so big that it's just impossible, literally. And so we've been pre-computing and storing the dot products so that when you're running your query, it's querying the dot products and not the vectors themselves, giving you, you know, a, a massively reduced latency. And that hasn't been possible before because you need a much more efficient storage format to be able to store data at that scale, right? So in any event, it's early days, but I am pretty excited about what's happening right now on the AI side. And like I said earlier, I think 
analytics will not be queries in the next three, four years. Analytics will be models. Um, and for that, I'm very excited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then um, we've covered the whole computational part really well right now. What about the data acquisition part? Because at some point you need to get the data into the system, right? That's always yeah. like the hardest part. And when I hear real time or, or you know, compute on the fly, I think of data in motion, right? I think of Kafka and other systems like that. But yep. um, can we can we talk a little bit about the the data pipelines? Like what needs to happen on the, I always call it the, the left side of the image, like data in, compute data, result out. Like what needs to happen on the, how do you, how do you acquire data? If, you, if I want to work with feature base, what needs to happen? I'm a bank. I install feature base. How do I get data in? Yeah, that's a good question. So we connect to data just like anything else, right? You can ingest it via SQL commands. Um, you can load it from S3. But the most common form of ingest for feature base is Kafka. Uh, and because of our unique update speed capabilities, right, without having to do upserts, without having to have separated, you know, reads and writes, um, we we have customers that are doing, you know, in the millions of updates per second, not inserts, updates per second. And it's really fun to see the data come to life inside of these systems. So I'd say nine out of 10 of our customers are connecting through Kafka. And even when they're bringing in historical data, oftentimes they're hydrating feature base from the historical data stores like Snowflake uh, using Kafka. Um, um, so Kafka is definitely our, our preferred method of ingest. Uh, it can be any pipeline, but you know, to us, data is now alive. It's not dead. It's not alive for a few moments and then dead again. Um, so, so the data pipelines for us are sort of the the, the preeminent form of of, of interaction. Mm -hmm. What what type of skill set do you see with customers? What is it that they need to have as a skill set to operate at that? It's a really great question. And so, the thirty million dollars that we've invested so far into this technology. Um, first went to proving that we could do it because we thought we were a little bit crazy. And then when we realized we could, uh, we've had the hard <laughs> realization that adoption is the only thing that matters, um, making it really easy to use. Uh, so we've spent the last 12 months and we'll spend about the next six months working on adoptability, right? Making it really, really easy to use, easy to integrate. So it's going to look and feel just like anything else. Right now, though, our ICP is the data engineer. Um, and we're starting a slow progression to start to open that up. Uh, I don't know what the number is. You hear a lot of conflicting numbers, but there's 25 to one data scientists to data engineers, right? These poor data scientists, you know, they get CSV files for training. Uh, you know, they spend all their yeah. time messing with the data. And when they go to production, it's impossible. We think there's a world where our ICP shifts to the data uh, scientists, where it's very easy for them, as long as they have permissions to connect to a stream, to connect to a cloud data warehouse, upload a model, have that model running in the compute. That's the biggest area of innovation we're doing right now, sort of in database compute of these models. Um, and whether it's in training or in production, you're now doing the machine learning in the database itself, right? And we're calling this the working memory infrastructure for AI. We see this entirely new class of storage developing. We don't need more data warehouses, they've been solved. We don't need more streaming pipelines, they've been solved. But what happens in the middle is, is, is the most critical piece. And, and so we think of like the streaming pipelines as sensory data, and we think of like the historical data and the data warehouses as long-term data. And we need a place to be able to bring it together to make decisions. And I'll give you an example, a very practical example. But when we met a month ago on a rooftop in San Francisco, um, you probably don't remember every single detail of our interaction. And even if you had all of the visual data, the auditory data, the sensory data, let's say you even had transcripts of the conversation, it would be impossible for you right now to be looking through that to help guide our conversation. However, yes. you remember key parts and context of that, uh, which you brought into your working memory. This is how our brains work. Uh, and everything we're doing right now is feeding into that working memory as well. And you're able to make decisions on the fly. This is the only way we're going to be able to scale our infrastructures to handle the onslaught of data that's coming. And we thought IoT and Edge made a lot of data. These generative models, um, AI, they're going to create an entire explosion of data that we can't even quantify. I think I heard yesterday, Brontobytes is the new petabyte. Um, 
So if we continue to have to scan and sort through all of our data every time we run an analytical query, every time we train a model, like we're never going to get there. And so we're trying to position ourselves between the streams and the cloud data warehouses and the, and the storage layer um, to bring the models in so that in this space, in one place consolidated, we can make decisions and we don't need 50 different platforms and engineers for every single project to be able to do what we're doing today. That's an interesting image. So on the one side, you have my streaming data pipelines where, you know, you get new data entering the system in real time. On the other end, you have the long-term historical data, the stuff that's already there, which too gets ingested through a stream. You said Kafka as well. And then in the middle, you have the working memory, which is uh, feature base, correct? There we go. Yeah. Look yes. at it. Yes. Fantastic. So here, here's a, a little diagram of how it works. And Believe it or not, if you go Google working memory and how we make decisions in our own brains, this is almost literally what it looks like. Um, so being able to bring together all the real-time data, making decisions about what goes to long-term data, we're already at long-term memory. We're already doing that, but we can't process on all of that at once. Uh, also, the streams make no sense without the historical context. We need to be able to bring these models in, whether there are private models or they sit on a on an exchange like Hugging Face and run those directly in our databases on the fly in real time. We need to be able to train them, uh, re-inference them, and make decisions as we go. And so, I'm pretty excited about uh, I'm pretty excited about what's happening in all of this space. But that's where we're trying to go. We we believe there's this new category forming, and 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 we're going for it. Mm -hmm. So, so what impact does this have on AI, or the use of AI for the, let's say, for the common Fortune 500 enterprise? Because today, you know, it's it's the, the companies who who can work truly work with these large models. Probably, I can count them with my you know five fingers with yeah. my one hand, right? And um, so, what that means is you you're making these models more accessible, more affordable, and simpler to, to run. Broadly correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and like you said, we're going through an AI renaissance right now, which is not only great for, for the future of AI, it's great for tech given the economic environment that we're in right now. I think you know AI is going to be a bright spot over the next couple of years. Um, but in the end, these are a couple of models that are controlled by some really big companies who have solved very large data problems using brute force methods uh, to enable them. And I think that uh, the world is a much better place when that type of infrastructure is available to everyone, right? Where it's a matter of permissions and not a matter of massive data infrastructure to be able to unlock them. And so that's the practical benefit. I personally get excited. You know, I wake up every day because I think we're on the verge of a super revolution. I think we as humans, you know, uh, are, are, are on the edge of being able to innovate at a pace that we can't imagine in agriculture, healthcare, life sciences. Um, and it's going to take unlocking the data and shifting from managing, moving and copying data to training and retraining and maintaining a network of models. And we're focused on the output of these models and networking these models, you know, hearing conversations over the last few days, I'm building curriculums on how you teach models and in which order you teach these models. But I think that that super evolution comes when we solve this data problem. It is still the biggest problem out there and nobody is solving it, right? That IDC statistic I gave you about nine out of 10 copies okay. being copies because we can't process on the raw data. It gets worse every year and significant. More. So imagine as we go from petabytes to brontobytes, what that ultimately means for energy consumption for, you know, for all of it. Yeah, yeah. The answer cannot be like more batch, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or yet another copy or yet another materialized view or yet another index, right? Like those are great yeah. short term fixes, but that's not the long term solution. We need more efficiency and scale outs. Great. But how about a more efficient format? Um, we're getting big boxes with giant amounts of memory lately that are much cheaper, but you know, we're not going to go back to running our entire business on one server. Um, that's not how the world's going to go. Yeah. So then as you're, uh, I'm going to call this category, um, the, uh, the working memory, that's what, yes. yeah. So when you build a category, right. Um, you need to find your first believers. It's like a religion. Right, so get your first believers, your first converts, and then build momentum with that. 
who, what industries do you see in your, I guess, in your sales pipeline or adoption pipeline? Like, or what type of person do you see? You mentioned the data engineer, but also what industries and use cases? What do you see? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think innovators have a real problem with this. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs that are really excited building really amazing technology, but they don't make it adoptable and they don't bring it down to sort of the level of the user. That's why, while it pains me, you can go to our our, our webpage and you see OLAP database built on bitmaps. It could not be more literal. I'm not calling it working memory. I'm not calling it, you know, there, th there's a fight for what feature stores ultimately are going to become, but consumers don't know how to buy and use those things. So we have to meet the consumers where they are. Um, so our real big push, like I said earlier, is starting to shift uh, as we become more adoptable on the database side, shifting to an ICP where it's not just the data engineer, but it's the practitioners that can leverage and use this technology again. And, you know, I, I will be the first to admit that a year ago, our customers that would use us, we were like the database of last resort. Um, you know, they, they we, we have a, a customer, one of my favorites, Trimmer Video, um, they're in the advertising world. It's an area that, that to your question, really leverages data at a very large scale. Um, they're processing somewhere about 120 billion updates a day. That's, uh, you know, sometimes uh, well over a million a second. Um, they were operating off a thousand servers on that infrastructure. Um, we've now reduced them to 11. Uh, so saving them millions and millions of dollars wow. a year. But more importantly, they can now do the predictions on consumers in a fraction of a second versus the two to three days that it would take before. So much faster, much more simple, uh, and much more efficient. Uh, now, all kinds of new products are getting built out on top of that. But the reason they took a risk on us is because literally they were they had no other place to turn, right? They tried everything you would think of, like from the Druids of the world to the Pinots, to the ClickHouses, to the Hadoops, and just nothing could solve the problem efficiently. Um, but we were very hard to use. Like we looked like a flux capacitor unless you had a DeLorean, um, you know, it wasn't really easy to implement. And so adoptability right now is our main goal so that we can do all of the other things that we know this is going to enable us to do. Yeah. I mean, that, that lesson reminds me a little bit of how Snowflake came about, right? Their first two segments were ad tech and gaming companies because they generated lots of data that they needed to cross join. And because you had short living campaigns, you needed to, I mean, put the data into action, which means like running batch jobs really fast and feeding that data back into some sort of action in the application. I mean, and when I hear you talk about this, it reminds me sort of your path. What's, what's, what, what you're doing. Um, what, what do I need to change? So everyone's talking about data apps right now, right? But if I use feature base and I, you know, I get the benefit and I get all these benefits. What needs to happen on the application side so so that I can use this data? You know, not a lot. Um, your queries might not look exactly like they do today, but uh, they're pretty similar. And so we tend to power a lot of uh, internally facing applications, um, customer facing applications. Um, and so, you know, it looks a lot like the applications that you write today. There's some real benefits to our data model that might change the way you do some of your queries. We're trying to abstract that away from the end user so they don't even have to think about that. Like we're starting to do more AI in our own database, like uh, you know, database design for AI is gonna have an advantage of really being able to use you know, it, its own secret sauce to make it better. So we have a, a early project called Schemer that is doing you know, dynamic schema optimization, things like that. But um, but ideally not much, uh, but it is a major mindset shift from all of the systems you typically have to put in place uh, to solve these problems. Um, but if you've got an established data pipeline and you're moving most of your data through Kafka, uh, even if you're moving it out to the to the data warehouses like, you know, Delta Lake, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, um, you know, we can sit right next to them. You don't have to replace anything um, and you can start doing simple things like ad hoc advanced analytics. Uh, you can, you know, give your users more power. Um, one thing I failed to mention earlier is that freshness isn't just about the data propagating through the system, but we have uh, some really, really big global multinational companies using us because we can propagate schema changes instantly as well. Um, so when you're using things like Elastic to try to solve some of these problems, it might take eight to 10 hours to re-index that data. But when you're computing on the data, raw data in real time, those schema changes are also instantaneous. So 
Um, right now, we're very much focused on open source, on community building. We retooled our entire sales motion about six months ago to be product led. Uh, it's starting to work beautifully. And so we hope more and more people are going to get to know us. But in theory, if we're just as easy to use, but we're that much more efficient and that much faster. I'm hoping that we will be in a data stack near you uh, very soon. Coming to you. Yeah, that's, I think I, nothing beats latency and simplicity, right? Like if you can deliver on that, then usually developers or analysts will, will find a way to adopt you. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. How can I, I'm like, how can I start using feature base? What, do, where do I have to go? What do I have to do? Great question. So on the website, you can start a trial immediately. I think we're the only demo anywhere close to a billion records. Um, so we automatically provision a million, a billion records. So you can see it running, um, at scale. Um, we have a, a downloadable version. We have a Docker compose. Uh, version, so you can have it up and running in a couple of minutes. Um, we also have a Discord community that we've just um, started up and very excited about what's happening there. So I know star counts are, I, I watched one of your earlier podcasts, um, star counts aren't everything, but we have about 2,500 stars and growing rather quickly. And so we're pretty excited about the community side of all of this. So I would say if you want to start to get to know it, you know, try it, download it, compile it, and come join our community and um, and uh, yeah, you can start to see the power of real time. And I think it's a misconception that real time is more complex. I think real time is actually easier. True real time is actually easier than uh, than batch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so with that, um, let's. I'm going to put myself into the shoes of. Um, I don't know. Should it be a CIO of a bank? Um, it feels like they have much bigger problems usually. Um, but yeah, let's just, <laughs> but let's just say I'm, I'm a departmental, um, VP of engineering at a wall street bank or at, let's say at a, uh, pharmaceutical company and I come across feature base and I say, this is the solution to our problems. What is your recommendation for them to get everyone else into the boat in the company and, and to adopt this new model? Like, how should yeah, they so, think about it? What are the steps they should take? Yeah, so I think it's it's a lot easier than it was six months ago, right? Six months ago, we'd put you through a sales process and you'd only get to adopt it after you signed a big old contract. Uh, today, our, our, our primary goal is adoption, right? So once you're convinced, then we're going to help you get other people convinced. And once they're convinced, we're still going to focus on adoption. Um, we had a really interesting one uh, come in uh, last week that started in the community, started in our Discord channels, um, and they're doing telemetry on 800 million OS installs uh, in real time. Um, oh, did you say what o OS installs? Yes, exactly. Eight, eight, 800 million of okay. them. And and uh, the account started at $1,900 a month. It was awesome. And as they build their product, um, you know, we're there to scale with them. Uh, we're, we're right now putting our serverless capabilities in preview. So our efficiency numbers that we talked about earlier are going to be even more efficient. And so it's fun to watch this account grow. Um, and so it's very easy to do that versus, you know, we try to force that, that account into a half million dollar contract, uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, and so it's very refreshing uh, not to have to do that. It's very refreshing to see them grow. And I would argue that in the end, it's going to be better for everyone. So it's, it's very easy now to get you in into the platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and whoever came into the trial, who was that was a developer first yeah. or a, a data a, engineer? Yeah, developer. Yeah, interesting. And that's the beautiful part of of, of community and open source, and you know, we're go very figure. excited about it. Yeah, exactly. If you had, if if we touch on the go to market side real quick, if you had a BDR, even the smartest BDR, I assume with those numbers, it's really hard to pinpoint that person. It, it would have been impossible. So hard. Right? I, it would have been impossible. Numbers. I'll share the numbers so that others don't make these same mistakes, right? We raised a $17.6 million Series A in, uh, in, in early 2021. Um, we put together the most classical enterprise sales team. Um, we had market fit. Um, we had a great open source project, and we decided to go top down. We had 606 meetings, uh, and we could get any meeting with any CIO. Amazingly, we had the CIO pitch down. 
Uh, and then we get a lot of false positives that CIO would then t introduce us into their data engineering teams. We'd get those meetings, but we'd literally show up at those meetings and everybody on the call would have their arms crossed and they'd say, how did you get this meeting? Why did my CEO set it up? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm a core committer to, uh, you know, Apache Impala and, you know, come hell or high water, I'm not moving mm -hmm. off of my Hadoop zoo, right? Like, um, so, so we, we became very threatening. And so out of those 606 meetings, we ended up with 12 massive, exciting, awesome customers. Um, but the CAC was just not, is not sustainable, right? And uh, we're doing the same sort of efficiency now with a fraction of the sales team. And yeah, we'll reintroduce some sales uh, down the road when we're looking at like product qualified accounts, right? When we can see big accounts that could benefit from committed contracts and tiering, but that's a couple of years down the road for us. So it's been very refreshing. Yeah, it changes the whole model, right? It's, it changes it's, everything. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think we covered a lot of ground. Is there something we forgot? Maybe energy costs. I'm trying to think like the compute hardware, like what any, any other interesting things? It feels like energy. We, we talked about energy, but, uh, yeah, the energy piece is re really, really, um, interesting. One of, one of our execs, Sarah King, she's obsessed with trying to quantify the energy savings. Um, you know, it's not just that, right? The efficiency can be quantified a number of ways. So she's been working on this like compressed limit, like you're 90, 95% smaller, but it's hard to, for a human to get a grasp on it, right? Um, so she's working right now to try to figure out how we can quantify the energy savings, but it's very significant. Um, and especially as we go into these AI workloads, I think that's an area of a lot of focus for us. I think interestingly, as we bring user-defined functions and embedded model execution into our own database, that energy calculation is probably just a function that we upload by default into the database. Um, so, so, you know, as we get a little bit further in the product, I think that's going to be very easy to implement, but it's a, it's a definitely a very important thing for us to push on. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, think we covered everything that people need to know right did i forget that was anything great. no should i ask you know, anything I... That, that was great and thanks for for uh letting us talk about the amazingness of bitmaps like they are so much more yeah. amazing than we all know um yet they're all around us i i feel that's going to be another standalone episode where we actually do a deep dive and and um I, I do want to call out that you have fantastic fashion taste in in wearing that vest it's uh <laughs> thank you we clearly have the same uniform yeah yeah i know right um hey it works right uh awesome ho this was fantastic thank you so much thank you. um how can people reach you if they want to talk to you or maybe you know well take feature base for a trial run they can do that on your website and your github repo but if you want if they want to engage directly with you what's the best way to uh, to reach you yeah, so HO at futurebase.com. Feel free to reach out. Um, our Discord server, Future First AI, um, is a great place too to come interact. Um, so, yeah, please feel free to reach out with any questions, any myths on bitmaps that you want me to help dispel, any use cases you want to talk through. Yeah, please reach out. Awesome. Uh, HO, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And you. Uh, I'm, I, we're going to do a deep dive on bitmaps. That's going to come too. Would love that. All right. It's fascinating. All right. Take care. Have awesome. a great day. Bye. Talk later. Bye.